Okay, for our second lecture, we will uh, pick up where we left off here with uh, an example of projectile motion that involves golfing. Uh, that's not uh, golfing is another good uh, example of uh, projectile motion because you hit the ball and at a you know with a club with a certain angle, and that will cause the ball to take off at a certain angle, and it goes up and over and down, and that is a parabolic motion. It's uh, Essentially, the golf ball is a projectile, and it obeys all the rules of projectile motion. <clears throat> um, and a lot of the skill in golfing has to do with predicting what angle you uh, the ball needs to take off at in order to land where you want it to, and which club, and um, you know how much force uh, on that club will give you that angle. Uh, anyway, in this example here, we have um, somebody who's on a second hole of a golf course. And the golfer is 120 meters from the green and wants, basically you're hitting the ball towards the green because that's where the cup is that the ball is supposed to fall into and wants to hit the ball 90 meters and let it roll onto the green. Uh, so the golfer angles are shot at 30 degrees to the horizontal. So this angle here would be 30 degrees in the first example and lets the ball roll after landing. Then on the fourth hole, he is 90 meters from the green and wants to let the ball drop with minimal rolling uh, after landing. So the shot is angled at 70 degrees to the horizontal the second time around on the, on the fourth hole. So the question here is what is the initial speed of the ball on the second hole? That is how fast is the ball going in the direction that it initially takes off in? And the same question for the fourth hole. Uh, the ball will be taking off at a different steeper angle for the fourth hole. And so the question is, what is the speed of the ball that will, mean that will be necessary to land the ball where we want it to uh, with the angle that was given on the fourth hole? And then uh, the trajectory equations for both. <clears throat> for the um, <coughs> trajectory equation, remember the tra trajectory, it, it figures they would choose a word that I have a hard time pronouncing. Uh, trajectory just means the path followed by the ball. And when they say trajectory equations, what they mean is an equation that will tell you the ball's position in terms of X and or Y coordinates at any given time during its flight. <clears throat> and so we'll have to come up with those. And then it wants a graph of the tra trajectories, which we'll see about later. <coughs> um, um, so the range equation can be used to solve for the initial velocity because um, the question told us what the ranges are and what the angles are in each case. So the range equation says that the range is equal to the original velocity squared times the sine of two times the angle over G. All you have to do is rearrange that and we find out that the original velocity is the square root of the range times g over the sine of two theta, or two times the angle. So in the case of uh, the four, or second hole, sorry, where the angle was 30 degrees and um, the range was supposed to be 90 meters, that gives us a square root of 90 meters times 9.8 meters per second squared over the sine of two times 70, or 100, sine of 140, in other words. And when you work that out, that's 37 meters per second. That's how far, that's how uh, fast, if this is 30 degrees and this distance here is 90 meters, then the ball should be going 37 meters, uh, uh, 37 meters per second when it takes off. In the second uh, instance on the fourth hole, uh, the range is still 90 meters, but the angle is 70 degrees. And working that out tells us that the um, initial velocity should only be 31.9 meters, uh, sorry, per second in order uh, to make that shot. In part C, they want the trajectory equations for this instance. And we saw uh, last time that um, the trajectory equation in terms of x is usually pretty simple. And it's more the question of where is it in terms of y? Uh, 
at any given moment. And because the, it's the y uh, trajectory or the y direction that's subject to gravity. The x direction is not subject to gravity. Normally a projectile um, will be traveling at a constant speed in the x direction. And um, you can just take up the equation that x final, or that is x at the end of whatever time period you're interested in, would just be x original plus the original velocity in the x direction times t. And so we have that equation if you want to know where the ball is in terms of the x direction. <clears throat> the original velocity in the x direction is just v original in whatever direction the ball happens to be heading times cosine of theta. So we can find uh, the, the original velocity in x direction. And since there is no acceleration in the x direction, the velocity in the x direction should not be changing. Uh, again, we're ignoring air resistance here uh, to keep things simple. In real life, the velocity in the x direction will be slowing down because of air resistance. But here we're assuming that doesn't exist. So we can assume that the, the velocity throughout its entire flight in the x direction will be the same as the original velocity in the x direction. So that's all you really need to do if you want to find the position in terms of x. <clears throat> For the y direction, things are more complicated largely because uh, the y direction, like I said, is subject to gravity because the y direction is up and down. So we saw the equation before that um, you can write it like this or you can write it like this. Uh, whether depending on whether you want to factor out the x or not. Um, but the um, position in the y direction at any given moment will be tangent theta. That is the tangent of the angle times x. It, that is its position in terms of x, which you can get from this equation. <clears throat> and uh, that will be minus g over 2 times the original velocity times cosine theta squared. Don't forget that times x squared. And again, the x's just come from this equation here. And there's uh, where time comes into it, right there. <clears throat> OK, so on the second hole, the y position is going to be um, basically 2.75 times x minus 0.0306 x squared. We get that from um, tangent uh, 70 degrees. Hang on just a sec. OK, wait a minute. That should be 30 degrees with, yeah, OK. Let me pause the video here while I fix this. OK, I think I found out what was going on here. Um, <clears throat> when I, I worked. Uh, when I worked these out, I was also looking at the book, and um, I think the book actually made a mistake in this case. I didn't notice it while I was working it out, but I noticed it as I started going over things just now. Uh, that is, um, basically, um, if you look at the solutions in the book, the first two solutions are basically reversed. They ask, uh, A is asking for the, um, the original velocity uh, on the second hole, and the second hole is where the angle is 30 degrees. And B is where they're asking for the range on the uh, fourth hole. The fourth hole is where the angle was 70 degrees. So they got these backwards. Although all of the numbers within the equation are consistent with each other. So this is entirely the fourth hole. So the, the original velocity for the fourth hole is 37 meters per second. And the original velocity for the second hole is 31.9 meters per second. <clears throat> the x, um, the equation for finding the x coordinate of the ball at any given moment remains the same. And the general equation for finding the y coordinate at any given moment uh, remains the same also. But what happens is when they actually put the numbers in, they got them backwards again. Uh, so the fourth hole would be. Um, tangent of 70 degrees times x minus 9.8 meters per second squared over 2 times 37 meters per second uh, 
times cosine of 70 squared times x squared. And when you work out the numbers, it comes out to 2.75x minus 0.0306x squared. And that's for the fourth hole. For the second hole, it's going to be tangent of 30 times x minus 9.8 meters per second squared over 2 times 31.9 meters per second times cosine 30 squared times x squared. And that comes out to 0.58x minus 0.0064x squared. We can't find the actual coordinates in x or y because they didn't give us a time. All they wanted was the equation for figuring out the uh, x. Well, actually, they didn't. They, um, in the question, they didn't specify x and y coordinates. They mentioned the uh, finding the trajectory equations, and uh, that's essentially what we've done. So uh, for the fourth hole, it would be that. For the second hole, it would be that. If you wanted to find an actual number for the y coordinate, you would first need to know the x coordinate at that particular moment, which you can get from this equation here. But again, in order to find this, you would need to know the time. And they didn't tell us the time. So we can't find a number. <clears throat> and the graph uh, would look something like this with parabolas. But I'm not going to spend a long time on that. Uh, anyway, two projectiles uh, launched with the same original velocity will have the same range if the uh, angles of launch are complementary. In other words, if the angles of launch add up to 90 degrees. <clears throat> In this case, we wanted the two balls to have the same range, but the angles, 70 degrees and 30 degrees, add up to 100 degrees, not 90. So that's why the original velocities had to be a little bit different, because the angles added up to a little bit more than 100. But just to illustrate that point, if, say, you were launching a projectile of any kind into the air with an original velocity in the direction of launch of 20 meters per second and an angle of, say, 75 degrees, and you work out the range, uh, you know, uh, the original velocity, so it's 20 squared, times the sine of 2 times 75 over 9.8 for, for g, and it works out to 20.4 meters. Well, the complementary angle to 75, that is the difference between 75 and 90, is 15. So suppose you launched a, a projectile with uh, an initial velocity of 20 meters per second and an angle of 15 degrees. Well, let's try doing that. The range is 20 squared times the sine of 2 times 30 over 9.8, and that works out to 20.4. So that's actually true. Seems odd, but yeah, if you uh, launch two projectiles with the same initial velocity at complementary angles, they will end up having the same range. <clears throat> um, there's also a section on. Uh, our assumptions about how big the range is compared to the Earth. Normally, we would assume that the range is small compared to the circumference of the Earth. And also, we tend to assume that the um, projectile is going to be in the air for a short enough period of time that the Earth will not have moved significantly under it while, the t you know, while it was in the air. And in large scale um, situations, that may not always be the case. So uh, if r, that is the range of the projectile, is large relative to the circumference of the Earth, then there are a few things that need to be kept in mind. We're not really going to do any detailed examples of this, but just for, you know, just for thought or future reference, if you get into this in any more detail in the future for any reason. Um, basically, if your projectile is going to be traveling a relatively long distance compared to the circumference of the Earth, then you have to keep in mind that eff effectively the surface of the Earth is curving away under the projectile as it travels. <clears throat> and the direction of gravity will also be changing along the way as the projectile's in flight. Because um, gravity pulls toward the center of the Earth. But as you're going around the circular circumference of the Earth, 
the center of the Earth, the direction is going to be changing as you go around the circumference. Up here, the center of the Earth will be here, but over here, the center of the Earth will be in this direction. So that's quite a difference. Um, <clears throat> the range will end up being larger than expected from the range equation because of the way the surface of the Earth drops away as you go along. Um, the, if, because the landing spot also is effectively lower than the launch site. We're used to, uh, basically we're used to a situation where it, when you launch a projectile, it comes back down to the, the same level or the same elevation. Here, effectively you've launched it from here, but it doesn't last land until down here. So that effectively makes the uh, landing site lower than the launch site. Uh, <clears throat> actually, this, the surface of the earth drops away five meters for every 8,000 meters along its surface. 8,000 meters sounds really long, but it's 8,000 meters is only eight kilometers. So it's maybe five miles. <clears throat> okay, and uh, then it goes on to just mention that if you have an initial velocity of 8,000 meters per second to your projectile, that's enough to put it into orbit. If you want to escape orbit and go out into outer space, it takes a lot more than that. Uh, you know, not a lot more velocity than that. And because of that, that's about the speed at which satellites are launched into low Earth orbit, about 8,000 meters per second. Okay, getting on to some more stuff. Uh, that, uh, you know, discussion of the Earth and the circular nature of the Earth uh, led into a section on uh, uniform circular motion, which is a bit of a deviation from what we've been talking about. So I'm going to skip um, section 4.4 for now, and um, we may come back to it later, but for right now, we'll go on to 4.5, okay? And that's why there are no uh, problems assigned from, uh, sec uh, you know, on circular motion from section 4.4, just because I was planning to skip it. <clears throat> okay, um, we'll come back to 4.4 if it's uh, relevant or if we need to, or if or if there's a popular uprising in favor of doing circular motion, if you really, really want to do it, let me know and maybe I'll change my mind. Otherwise, we'll move on to relative motion in one and two dimensions. <clears throat> this is a very useful thing to be familiar with because very often we want to study things that are in motion relative to something else. And it's not always convenient to use a stationary object as your point of reference. Say for instance, if you're traveling on an airplane, well, actually I used a train, that was a little more old fashioned. Um, you're traveling on a train and you're walking around on the train. Uh, you know, it's a passenger train, obviously. Uh, it would be much easier to trace the motions of the person on the train relative to the train, even though the train itself may be moving relative to the earth, uh, it would be much easier to, you know, follow the person's motions relative to the train than it would be to try to follow the person's motions relative to the earth. Because in order to do that, if you're moving around on a moving train, you would first have to come up with an equation to describe your motion relative to the train. Then you would have to come up with an equation for the train's motion relative to the earth. And then you would have to combine those two equations. And only then could you get your um, an equation for your motion relative to the Earth. <clears throat> and that's you know that's more complicated, but we will see how to do that. That brings into uh, frame, so to speak, the uh, idea of reference frame. Uh, reference frames are basically just what is your reference? What what are you describing the motion relative to? And again, um, ideally, you, you generally would like to uh, choose a reference frame that's stationary uh, or relatively stationary. I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, the Earth itself is not stationary. The Earth is rotating on its axes and it's revolving around the sun in the uh, solar system. And the solar system is moving within the Milky Way galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy is moving relative to the rest of the universe. So really when it comes right down to it, nothing is stationary. But from our point of view, the earth appears to be relatively stationary. So that is probably the most convenient 
uh, quote unquote stationary uh, reference point. Uh, but you can use other uh, reference points as well. <coughs> um, like I said, uh, you know, with the example of the train, you can use the train as a reference point. Uh, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, okay. So I mentioned all of that. Um, and so, if um, basically when you're you know, when you're using reference frames, you will relate motion to the primary reference frame, but then you can relate that reference frame to a different reference frame. And that ends up relating the original motion to the uh, you know the the secondary reference frame. It's kind of like what I was saying about relating your motion to the train's motion and relating the train's motion to the Earth's motion, and that way you can relate your motion to the Earth. <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, just a relatively simple case of um, motion in one dimension would be a person sitting on a train. The train is moving east. And in this case, we're defining east as being positive x direction. And with the Earth as a reference frame, the velocity of the train re with respect to the Earth, which we can re represent as v, the vector v for velocity, with a subscript of te for train relative to Earth, is 10 meters per second i, uh, the, times the unit vector i for the x direction. And since the number is positive, that would imply that the train is moving east at 10 meters per second. If person then gets up and walks toward the back of the train down the aisle at two meters per second, then the velocity of the person relative to the train, which we would represent as vector v with a subscript pt, person relative to train, would equal negative two meters per second times unit vector i. And the negative two is because you're moving to the west relative to the train. And the west is the negative x direction. To find the velocity of the person with respect to the earth, what you're going to have to do is take the velocity of the person relative to the train and the velocity of the train relative to the earth. Okay, so VPE, that is the velocity of the person relative to the earth, is the velocity of the person relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the earth. Okay, so VPT plus VTE. Notice how the inside terms for the subscripts end up canceling out. And that's the way it works with questions like this. So VPT plus VTE, the T's cancel, and we get VPE. So uh, that would just be 10 meters per second times unit vector i plus negative 2 uh, meters per second times unit vector i equals ultimately 8 meters per second times unit vector i. So in other words, the person relative to the Earth is moving east, but at only 8 meters per second rather than 10 meters per second because the person is moving uh, basically against the motion of the train at two meters per second. So that's, that's a simple example of that. I think we're out of time for this session. So I'm going to stop there and we'll pick it up in two dimensions in the next segment. Okay, so we'll see you in a moment.